Ladies and gentlemen, tonight the subject of This Is Your Life is actually here in this building. A man who is in the news today, so much so that he thinks he's here to do an interview for a special program. In a few moments, he'll be coming through a door over there from a dressing room down the corridor. He doesn't know there's an audience here. He certainly doesn't know that I'm here, although he knows me and I know him, as indeed you do too. Fingers crossed. Good evening, Henry. Come uh, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Henry, as we all heard on the news today and saw, you've signed to meet Jack yes, Fidel for the Bridge and Empire titles, but as yeah. I think you've gathered as you stepped in the door, we have a little more to say to you than that, which yeah. is, of I'll course... I'll have a little more to say to women. I'll get in <laughs> <laughs> Henry Cooper, tonight, this is your life. sit down there because for once in your lifetime there's no point in fighting back Henry and the first greeting to you tonight comes from 3,000 miles away from Cleveland Ohio the voice of one of your greatest admirers Muhammad Ali hello Henry you're getting old you old man you you were not fast enough on your feet that time I'll be back to talk to you later <laughs> you will indeed Mr. And I hope by the time you come back, Muhammad, that our satellite will be over there, over Cleveland, Ohio, so that we can see you and hear you as well. Never mind, but first of all, Henry, I want to give a ringside seat tonight to the people who are your closest people and who've been in our secret for weeks. The Cooper family, beginning with Dad, Harry Cooper. Sit down, of course, the girl who hates the job you do but loves you, your wife, Albina, Mrs. Cooper. Here she is. Well, there you are. And I'm only sorry that your mother, Mrs. Lily Cooper, can't be here, but as you know, she's laid up with flu, but in fact, she's watching you here tonight from the home in Margate that you bought for your parents just three years ago. I hope you get better very quickly, Mrs. Cooper. Uh, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, this is the story of the gentle champion, a professional in a hard and punishing sport whose qualities as a man have won him love and admiration well outside boxing. Now, it was those very qualities, I know, that won him his wife, because you don't like boxing, Albina, do you? No, I don't. I, um, I, um, I don't sort of watch boxing, and, um, and then he always says to me, I don't see why I worry, because he never feels the punches at the time. But, yeah. but now, if that's the way you feel about boxing, why, in fact, did you marry a boxing champion? Oh, that's easy, because he's a very nice person and gentle and a marvellous husband and a good father. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a quite a compliment. And there are two very important people who know you as, as a family man who can't be here tonight. The reason is, of course, that they're too young to come to the studio, but they wanted to be on the show. And if you look here, there they are from your home at Wembley, your two sons. Hello, Daddy. I bet you're surprised to see us. <laughs> <laughs> That's Henry and John. Oh, it's John Shy. <laughs> don't you, John? Go on and say hello to Daddy. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he's super in boxing. He's, uh, well, he knocks everybody out, as far as I know. <laughs> We, we, we asked them then about whether you play with them when you come home and what his favourite trophy well, is. Well, we usually play... Well, he usually is on the ground. He starts fighting with us, well, just larking around. Which is your favourite? The one the Queen gave to my father. That one over there. In the boxing ring. A miniature boxing ring, standing up. <laughs> Thank you very much, Henry, Marco and John. <laughs> Wow. 
Uh, Henry, I know that from talking to you before on another subject, you've got pretty definite ideas about how you bring up children, haven't you? Well, in my own way, yeah. Same way as we was brought up, more or less, yeah. In fact, I think that I know that you've thought a lot about it, and you once said that you took as your guide the best of what happened to you in your childhood. Mr. Cooper, what were they like, the twins, as children? Well, they were good pals, but they used to have a punch-up now and again, you know. All in good fun, like, but we had to step in now and again to stop them. Tell me, what started <laughs> them off unboxing? Well, I think uh, my mother got them interested. She knew all the old-timers, because my father was an old-time fighter, you know, in the old knuckle days. And uh, she used to tell them all the stories, and I think that got them interested in it. Your, your dad used box with who? Uh, well, he travelled with Ted Pritchard, who was the middleweight champion of England at the time, for six months, sparring exhibitions all over the country with him. And he knew Jim Mace and all of them. Well, obviously, the boys took uh, great notice of all this, especially Henry. And I think it was yeah. about this time that he began to develop burn of that uh, deadly left hand of his, right? It certainly was. Uh, we was quite young at the time, and I, I was four years older than Henry and quite a bit bigger. I was sparring with him one day and he caught me with such a beautiful left hook he nearly put me out and George had to literally haul him off me to to save me further punishment. Um, <laughs> I didn't ever spar with him anymore after that anyway. Um, I know when we was kids I think he must have been about six years old you know I can remember laying in bed with him and George and he used to say then I'll be the champ one day I'll, you know I'll be the champ you know. And he was. I remember and, that then, yeah. And I believe that you, George, you once knocked Henry out. With a bit of help, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of help from whom? A gas stove, actually. What, uh, yeah. what do you mean, the gas stove? Did you throw it at him? Well, my uncle John bought us a set of gloves and uh, we put them on and went into each other, hammer and tongs, and he went back, hit his head on the gas stove, and that was him out cold. <laughs> <laughs> But, mm. Bernard, I think that uh, Henry got his own back on George later on, between the pair of you, that is. Oh, yeah. Well, one day when Mum was out, we got Dad's uh, one of his razors and we gave George an ear cut. Well, it was, it was halfway <laughs> up his head and we was laughing. We said, don't tell Mum, but as soon as she came in, he didn't have to tell her. She saw it and we mm. both got a good wallop on it. You know? <laughs> but then being twins has got you into a couple of spots, George, hasn't it? Oh, not much, yeah. One day I'm, Henry could s swim before I could. I'm watching him in the pool one day. Someone threw me in and they wouldn't come and get me out. They thought well, I was Henry. <laughs> I nearly drowned it. I nearly wasn't here. <laughs> but, Mr Cooper, that, um, that incident with the gas stove where Henry got knocked out with his head, of course, that was the last straw for Mrs Cooper, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yes. The gloves went away for about two years. They never saw him again. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, in fact, by this time, the war and the blitz of London had begun, and your house in Bellingham was hit by a landmine, and you and your brothers were evacuated to Lansing. I gather it wasn't exactly a very happy time. Well, no, going away from, you know, oh, we was only kids, I suppose we were all a bit scared going away, and we was like strange people, more or less, and uh, I suppose the poor woman down there tried to do her best, but we wasn't happy, and we was down there, we were, I suppose, with another four kids, I remember a big crowd of us, you know, and, uh, you know. You felt the same, George, I reckon. Yeah, we didn't enjoy it too much. <laughs> well, anyway, fortunately, you're soon back to your parents in Stroud, and then shortly afterwards, your old home in Bellingham. Your father is injured in a factory accident, and then later had to go away to the war. Now, for your mother in particular, this is a tough time trying to feed and clothe growing boys on an army private's pay. And do you remember what she had to do to make ends meet? Oh, well, she done several. I think she went out, uh, like, you know, doing scrubbing housework, and then she went into the school mill. It's like, you know, serving us with school mills. I suppose that was handy because we got an extra portion, you know. It's not what <laughs> we could do with it as well. Well, I know that you never forget the sacrifices that your mother made. And indeed, as soon as you and George begin to win prizes as amateur boxers, you persuade your mother to sell them sometimes to buy something for herself. Yeah. I believe, in fact, Mr. Cooper, that you had quite a few canteens of cutlery in the yeah, house. I think it was about 11 or 12. And we used to put them all on a big table about Christmas time. And some members of the family used to come around and sort out Christmas presents which was to our benefit. Yeah. Henry said, sell them and keep the money, I don't want it. <laughs> well, you might never have won those canteens of cutlery or those prizes, or become what you are today, if a wartime fireman, this is an extraordinary story in London, had not stopped one day to watch you at the age of about nine, having a sparring match on Bellingham Green. Now, he's 75 now, you haven't seen him for 25 years, but he's here tonight, and he's Bob Hill. <laughs> Well, Bob, you better tell us what happened there on Bellingham Green, will you? Well, I was looking through my window one day and um, 
I saw a crowd of children skylarking about, you know, and I saw this lad, he, he, he spied up, you know, and I thought to myself, well, he, he got something good there, so I, I went round to his home and took him round there. And I went in the scullery there, and there was his mother and father sitting in the corner there. And I said, you going to let this boy go boxing, eh? He, he wants some boxing lessons, see? And his old dad's sitting in the corner, and they were open, she'd say yes, you could see it all over his face, you know? <laughs> and he's, after hanging for about two hours, she said yes, only on one condition, that they'd never fought one another. So, by, after getting, waiting for Giddo's decision, I took him straight down there, and they haven't looked back since. And they've been a credit to everybody all concerned. We have indeed, and you've got a great eye on your head. Thank you very much, Bob Hill. Oh, <laughs> Well, as teenagers, you and George here go on boxing as amateurs with the Eltham Boxing Club. You leave school and learn your trade as plasters, and then you go into the army to do your national service. Henry had a fit when he found out who his sergeant major was going to be. It's 17 years since you saw him, Mick Cavanagh. Mick, tell us why the shock when Henry found out who was the sergeant major. Well, a few months before uh, Henry joined the army, yeah. my club, Birkenhead Boxing Club, were boxing Eltham. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Cooper twins, George and Henry, didn't have an opponent. So I volunteered, and Henry was the choice. How old are you then? I was 34, he was 17. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me, how did you get on? I didn't. <laughs> The first round, you know, very, very fast, and uh, by the end of the first round, I was really blowing hard. I went back, I had two very small seconds, a flyweight and a bantamweight, wow. and um, I came out for the second round after listen listening to all the very good advice, <laughs> and uh, I was met with a left jab and found myself on the seat of my pants. So I thought, aye, aye, I'll watch that, watch that left hand. <laughs> anyway, I got up, and the next thing I remember, the referee was stopping the fight, and George and Henry were backing me to the corner, I didn't watch. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Mick, the next time you met? Well, when he joined the army, you know, I went in up to see him, you know, and uh, he approached the army the way he did his boxing. You, as you know, you all know, he's a dedicated boxer. Well, he did the same there, he was modest, he tried hard, never gave anybody any trouble at all. And I've often thought since, if all boys grow up like Henry Cooper, well, we'll have nothing to worry about. Thank you, Mick Cameron. Thank you. <laughs> Now, in the army, Henry Cooper, who had already become the youngest ever amateur boxing association light heavyweight champion, won his second ABA title and the army and imperial services twice. And here he is at Wembley in 1952. The amateur championships at Wembley, with Cooper of Eltham slogging out the light heavies final with McLean of Scotland. Max, the one in the darker mist, who just missed with that right. And now it's Cooper swinging away. Clean stuff of beauty there. If there's not a lot of skill, there's certainly plenty of action in these bouts. And Cooper's the winner on points. Well, you can take him up later if you like about the not a lot of skill there. <laughs> I suppose you'd still oh, along with. I just know it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, a hard and deadly puncher in the ring, this fellow, but modest and gentle outside it, but certainly not foolish. And I want to just give you a quote, uh, Henry, that I've only heard once before, and I don't know whether you know this. I'd never heard it before from anyone else, but it said that you refuse to believe in the tales of Hoffman. Well, I'll tell you who said that. He's your manager who's guided you to British Empire and European Championships, one of the great characters of boxing, Jim Wicks. You're in trouble afterwards, Jim, but let's forget about it for now. <coughs> tell me, how did the tales of Hoffman and the opera get mixed up with boxing? Well, I'll tell you, the late uh, J.T. Howells recommended them to come to me. They came around before they did their national service, you see. So I said, have you done your national service? They said, no. I said, we'll go in as amateurs, and then if you fancy Tony Pro, come and see me. Well, that was the mistake I made. Because Why didn't you sign them up there and then? Well, I thought, you know, being honest like yourself, I thought I'd give them a chance to make up their mind whether they wanted to turn or not. Anyhow, they had a lot of principle, and when they did their service, they came back. But in the meantime, all the managers in England were going down to their army camp. 
promising them the crown jewels if they signed up with them and telling them the tales of Uffman and uh, <laughs> anyhow they had a lot of principle when they finished they came round to me I and you know we signed the... up on television. I don't know what the tales of Hoffman mean in that parlance. What about the early days with them Jim? Did you have any problems with them being twins? <laughs> twins they used to make it so awkward. They wear the same ties, the same shoes, the same suits. I used to be talking to Henry for George and George for them for a fortnight I was doing this. And of course George was, he's got a little bit taller since, you know. No, I can tell him in his sleep, but I couldn't in those days. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Well, out of the army, Henry Cooper uh, did three things. He went back to the council house at Bellingham, went back to being a plasterer and turned professional boxer. And then came the night of his first professional fight. That was at Haringey Arena on the 14th of September, 1954. Can you remember how you felt that night of your first pro fight, Henry? <coughs> well, naturally, you know, on edge, and naturally you want to, you know, do good, and you was hoping that you was going to do good, you know, but all very nervous, I suppose, you know. Yeah. Was that, or was it later in your career, I believe, that you uh, composed a special prayer of your own? Oh, I can't remember that. Uh, you'll have to refresh my memory over that, Ivan. I haven't got a note of the prayer, but I'll pray that I remember it, or someone right, will tell right. me later, but somebody did tell me earlier about that. Anyway, that particular first night, the, the first man you met, have you ever met him since? Well, never since. I know it was Harry Painter, but I've never met him since. Uh. You haven't, but you're going to meet him again for the first time after that one and only meeting. Harry Painter it is. Come in, Harry. <laughs> Well, now, Harry, as you heard Henry tell us, this was his first professional fight, and I gather it was also your last. Yes, it was my last. I, uh, I thought, well, he's an amateur, he'll be fit, but nothing much else. And, well, when I went into the ring, I very soon found out different. He soon uh, put me in my place on the floor. Of the first round? Yes. <laughs> well, I believe you wanted to fight him again. Yes, I wanted to return with him, but uh, the wife, I just got married, like, and the wife said she thought it was a good time for me to pack up, so I thought it was too, so <laughs> I turned it in. <laughs> Thank you very much, Harry Painter. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I don't know, Harry, what you were paid for that night, but I know the twins between them got 65 quid. Mr. Cooper, tell us, what do they do with that purse, their first well, purse? They, they bought us a television set, the first television set with that. If they hadn't a done press, we wouldn't have had one now. <laughs> well, that win over <laughs> Harry Painter saw Henry Cooper on the long climb to the top. But in 1956, there were four bad defeats which had the press writing him off and actually beseeching him to retire. Did you, in fact, during that year, think seriously of retiring yourself? Well, naturally, I suppose, you know, your confidence was shaken a little bit because... I thought I was doing everything I should be doing and what I, and I was doing in the gym what I thought I had to do but nothing would sort of come out right in the ring and so I had four bad defeats but uh, Jim sort of had confidence in me and he said well, we'll go to the continent and that's what we did. And you didn't retire obviously well, as we all know not only that but he hauled himself off the floor of his career and on the night of January the 12th 1959 he beat Brian London to become the British and Empire heavyweight champion. The following year, you married Albina. Now, Albina, as you told us earlier, you don't like boxing. So will you tell me how you meet and marry a boxer? Yes. Um, I was working in my uncle's restaurant. I was a waitress in Peter Mario's. And Henry used to come in with Uncle Jim. <laughs> and um, he always used to have all these really escalop and spaghetti. And one evening, he asked me, <laughs> he asked me out, and I thought he was kidding, you know. But he came, the next evening, he came in all dressed up. <laughs> and there I was working. And uh, he sat at the table and went up and asked him what he wanted to eat. So he said, I thought we were going out. I said, oh, I thought you was kidding. So he ordered the omelette and went out all mad. And then he never came near the place for about three weeks. So I thought More I had miserable it. <laughs> <laughs> but when he came three weeks later, you did go out with I him. I made sure I did, yes. <laughs> and so came marriage, two fine children, and a career that took you steadily upwards. You win three Lonsdale belts outright, hold the British title for longer than anyone, and are awarded the OBE. <laughs> so, Henry, the... Uh, the fellows you beat still like you in spite of that left hand, and they all wanted to come along tonight and shake you by the right hand. Two of them, Joe Erskine and Brian London, are knocked out by flu, oh, but okay. I'll tell you who is here, Dick Richardson and Billy Walker, and the man you signed against today, Jack Bedell.
Hello, Bill. Oh, well, Jim. I believe that when you started your career, Henry here was a bit of an idol to you, wasn't yes, he? Yes, I was a, oh, a novice amateur when uh, Henry won the championship, and I thought, well, that old man will be finished with time I'm ready, but he's still going very strong, <laughs> as I know. <laughs> and Dick, you, when you that famous fight in fourth call, you, you thought you had it all buttoned up, didn't you? Yes, well, I had him done on Dick in the fifth round, like, you know, and he got up and hit me with the greatest left hook you've ever seen, mate. And I didn't get up. But I've always tried to coax him to play rugby because I know I could do him at that. <laughs> <laughs> and Jack, when you came up there now, you shook hands with Henry. I reckon that's the last time you're going to shake hands with him between now and March 24th. Yes, the next time we'll be trying to knock his block off. Henry. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, after the fight, in material, who wins? I still have the same respect for Henry. Uh, I think he's been a, you know, a good man for the job. He's a family man and he's been a credit to the game. Thank you very much, Jack. And there's one boxing friend of yours, Henry, who's not here tonight. Not, not exactly a heavyweight. He's five foot five and a half inches, weighs in at eight stone two, and he'll be 14 tomorrow. Come in, Archie McAteer. <laughs> well, Archie, you live in Preston, which is a long way from where Henry lives in Wembley. Uh, tell us, you know, how did you meet him? Well, I wrote to Mr. Cooper, asking for some advice on how to develop a perfect left hook. Yeah, and did he give you some advice? He did a thousand times better. He and Mr. Wicks wrote me a letter back asking me to go down and uh, stop with them for three or four days, and I did do, and I really enjoyed it. I uh, trained with him, ate with him. I even slept in the same hotel as him, and I even boxed with him, sparred with him. <laughs> and he gave you a present, didn't he? Yes. It, um, just be the night before I left, he gave me a, one of his own training vests. Does it fit you? <laughs> no, I've got quite a bit to grow before you. <laughs> but wasn't there one thing that he and Jim wouldn't allow you to do? Yes, that was road work at four o'clock in the morning. Why was that? Because they said uh, if I, I was so small, and if I went out running at that time, the foxes would come and eat me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Archie McAteer. Thank you very much. Well, I have all the memorable bouts that... Henry Cooper is for two stand out above all the others in people's memories. Both were against the man we heard at the top of the show, Muhammad Ali. In 1963 at Wembley, you hit Clay with a punch that set him hard on the seat of his pants. That famous left again in the fifth round, cuts around your eyes, caused the referee to stop the contest, and it was cuts again that stopped your world title fight against Muhammad Ali in 1966. Now, those were tough contests for both of you, but Muhammad Ali formed opinions of you then, not only as a boxer, but uh, which he can express himself, but as a man. And here he is from Cleveland, Ohio. Hello, Muhammad, are you hearing us? Fine, how are you doing? Fine, nice to hear from you again. I know that you should yeah. be in another part of Ohio now at a very important luncheon, but when you heard it was Henry, you said, they can wait. Why? Yes, they had a big luncheon here. We're pro promoting the Rocky Marciano fight, which will be seen there in England, Wednesday coming. About 500 press men are waiting, and I this conflicted with Henry Cooper's uh, life story, so I told him they'll just have to wait. I have to talk to my man, and I also wrote a poem for Henry, and it goes like this. Henry... If they ever have a this is your life for me, I hope they bring you around because you're the only man that's really knocked me down. <laughs> you're pretty fast. You have a good left hook. Henry, you are not as dumb as you look. <laughs> Mohammed, why, why do you have, you've met thousands of people in your life and you've got to this point, why do you have this respect that you've told us you have for this young man here? I've never been hit that hard in my life. I've been <laughs> hitting amateurs, a boy named Sonny Banks knocked me down, but that really wasn't a, more of a slip. But Henry Cooper is one of the hardest hitters in the history of boxing. And it's just too bad he cuts as easy as he do. He gave me my two roughest fights. He's, I consider him the fastest heavyweight, the most tricked trickiest next to myself and I'm sorry that he didn't get to fight James Ellis because I'm sure he would have won and uh, I think it's a shame that they didn't uh, let him participate in this homemade championship thing they have going because Henry Cooper was much better than many boys who fought for my title. Any likelihood Mohammed uh, of yourself and Henry being inside a ring together again? Well I really don't know uh, I'm having my problems here and there I'm getting ready to do a few things, write a book, make a few movies, and right now I'm not thinking about fighting. But uh, I'm getting a little old now. I'm starting to shave, and I don't think I can stay around as long as Henry Cooper. 
Five, but one last question. You know, question. he's an old man. <laughs> Five, but very briefly, how would you sum him up? I sum him up as a great fighter, one of the best of all time, but I don't think he never had the chance to really prove himself because during his best fights, uh, the cuts open up on him and that stopped the fight. And out of the ring, I've met him at press conferences. He seems to be humble. Prestige hasn't gone to his head. And he's a humble, nice, gentle fellow, and I like him. Thank you, Muhammad. What more can I say? The gentle champion, Henry Cooper, this is your life. Thank you, Muhammad. <laughs>